Are front wides worth it? The answer to that is no. Well, at least not right now. We're going to take a look at it from a mixing standpoint, and I will show you exactly why it's a waste of time and money. Now I'm going to go over a lot of new information. I'm trying to get through it as fast as possible. Now, the first thing we need to do is designate between bed layer and bed track, because these are two totally different things. And I think there's a lot of stuff on the internet and you know people get things confused so bed layer in a consumer's home theater stands for the amount of speakers in your ear level speaker system right so if you have a 5.1.4 you have five bed layer speakers in a 7.1.2 or 7.1.4 or 716 you have seven speakers right as your bed layer that's your ear level and for a 9.1.6 you have nine speakers in your bed layer so that's the consumer side on the mixing side or the Atmos creation side, a bed track consists of a 7.1.2 configuration, which means seven ear level speakers, the one LFE channel, and the point two is two height channels. So when we say bed layer, it means one thing. When you say a bed track, it means something totally different. Now that the distinction has been made between bed layer and bed track, we can now move forward. In the Atmos mixing environment, there is another type of track called an object track. Now, if you place a sound in that object track, you can move it all around the room. It is not encumbered or it is not locked or stuck in a configuration like a bed track, right? You can move this all around the room and it's all good. Now, all in all, there are a total of 128 tracks in an Atmos mixing session. The first 10 tracks are reserved as a bed track. Remember, the bed track consists of seven plus one LFE channel plus two high channels equals 10. So the first 10 tracks are reserved as a bed track and the other 118 tracks are object tracks. Let's take a look at the Dolby Atmos renderer so you can see what's going on in every section. On the left of the Dolby Atmos renderer, we have 128 circles that represent each of the 128 possible tracks. The first 10 outlined in purple at the top here are 10 channels of the bed track, the 7.1.2 I spoke about earlier. So when I press play on a bed track, we can see the different circles light up, letting us know that if these first 10 circles light up, we are playing a bed track. Now, if I play nothing but object tracks, we see something a little different. On the left, we see circles light up, which are not included in the first 10 tracks outlined in purple. That's the first indication that object tracks are being played. The second indication, and the most obvious, is that we see object balls in the render box to the right. We also have the level meters in the top center, where we can see the levels of sound as it pertains to each speaker. Below that, we have a speaker diagram where speakers are represented by circles and labeled, so when a sound is played, they light up, like you see here. Now I know what you're wondering. Hey Technodad, can we play all 118 object tracks at once? The answer is yes. I created this the other day and you can see all 118 objects are lit up on the left. And look, it's just crazy. I it took me a while to space all these out so you can kind of see all 118 if we move the renderer box around. All right, let's go for broke, add the 10 bed tracks and have all 128 of those little circles light up. And here's what that looks like. All 128 tracks are active and playing. So why am I showing you all this? It's very simple. If we know how to read and understand what's going on in the Dolby Atmos renderer, I will show you exactly why. If you are running front wide speakers in your home theater, chances are you are barely ever hearing anything out of them. Okay, let me explain. Since the bed track is designated as a 7.1.2, it only has seven ear level speakers. So when I play a bed track, we can see the level meters that the front wide left and front wide right have nothing playing in them. If we look down, we also see that those speakers are not lighting up in the speaker layout section. So does that make sense? A bed track only consists of seven ear level speakers. And if you have nine ear level speakers, there's just no information going into those speakers from a bed track. So how do we get speakers out of your front wide left and right? Easy. We need to make some objects. So I made two object tracks and positioned the objects where the front wides would be and when I hit play, we can see that the meters for left wide and right wide have sound coming out of them. We can also see the wide speakers and speaker layout section are on and firing. So what does this mean? It's actually quite simple. Since 
the bed track is locked at 7.1.2. The only way the sound will come out of your front wide speakers is if the mixer places a sound into an object track and just happens to move it through this location in the render box. Now, a little bit ago on YouTube, there was a mixing engineer that said something like, they're just dots in a box, and that could be the farthest thing from the truth. The dots in these specific locations in this box represent each speaker individually. These are all the speakers in a 9.1.6 configuration minus the LFE channel since the LFE channel would never show up in the renderer box because it is part of the bed track. And we can tell by the level meters being identical that the sound is coming out of each speaker equally. Here's another example of that. I'll play a file that I created for the Spatial Audio Calibration Toolkit. Don't forget to support the channel by picking yours up today. Shameless plug, I know. So here's a file, it's a 9.1.6 callout. Notice that each speaker only plays by itself and it corresponds to the dots being in those specific locations in the renderer box. So the location of the dots in the renderer box is very important when it comes to which speaker the sound is going to originate from. So for the next part of this demonstration, I'm going to highlight the front wide left meters and the speaker diagram so you guys know exactly when the sound will be coming out of your front wide speaker. So here's another file where we have sounds moving from front left speaker to the front wide left speaker, back to the front left speaker, then through the front wide location, to the surround left speaker. And finally making its way back through the front wide left and ending up at the front left again. This is one of the movements the mixing engineer needs to have in the movie for anything to come out of your front wide speaker. The same can be done with the sound starting at the center channel and making its way into both front wide speakers back to the center channel and then through to both surround channels and back through the wides and into the center channel again. Now the mixer can also have the object move through the room alongside the front stage to engage the wide channels like this. At the end of the day, the mixing engineer needs to place objects moving around in this rectangular area on screen to ensure that front wides will be utilized if you have them in your system. So the big question is, how often are we gonna see this in movies? In music, it's a little bit different. Like I could just go ahead and place music or notes or different elements in the front wides, no problem. But with a movie, the action of what's happening right in front of the viewer has to coincide with what's happening on the screen, meaning there has to be some sort of context on the screen for you to have sounds moving in those directions right in front of the viewer. So. When is that gonna happen? How often does that happen? And do you think the mixers are actually going to start implementing that kind of stuff into movies? Let me know down in the comments below. Both Elon Osborne and Shane Lee spoke about how Godzilla versus King Kong has a really active Atmos mix, and there was a lot of information coming out of the front wide channels. Now, if you check out Shane's video, he shows the Trinov viewer and he shows the little balls moving through the area I just showed you in the Dolby Atmos renderer a few minutes ago. Why is nobody else talking about this? Well, they probably don't know because I only found out about it when I made the 160 Little Atmos movies that I did for the Spatial Audio Calibration Toolkit. And when Joe and I found out that, hey, something's, something's amiss here, well, I figured out exactly what needed to be done to have sound coming out of the front wides. And you'd be surprised about how many people actually just have no idea this is happening or in this case, what's not happening in those front wides. Anyway, it brings me back to the one thing I talked about in a previous video. Maybe we need to have multiple mixes for movies. We have the smallest configuration of Atmos. We have a 5.1.2 mix. We have a mix for the most common or the most recommended 7.1.4 and now we need a mix for 9.1.6 and i know some of you are going to say well that's what dolby atmos does it matrixes no matter what you have but if you've watched my previous video and i'll link it down in the description you'll find out that atmos doesn't really matrix that well or at least as well as dolby's marketing department <laughs> would uh want you to believe and i feel like if i'm making a mix for music which i am working on a few 
I might actually just go ahead and start putting stuff into those front wide channels so everybody can hear that when they are using a 9.1.6 configuration. So that might be something we need to actually think about doing so that everybody that has a different system can experience Atmos in the optimal way. Maybe we need to optimize for 512, 714, and 916 separately. I don't know, just a thought, but I think that will be the way we can ensure the best Atmos experience for the listener or viewer or whatever. Anyway, let me know what you think down in the comments below. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.